there were limits of what my laptop, for instance, could handle without breaking down. I don't know how much I'm allowed to tell on the podcast about it, but it's an artificial intelligence that helps to select images. There are several different ways, actually. There are several different techno signatures that can be detected by us. So, of course, we, we would be interested in any sort of unexplainable red transient. I think it's a bit of an obsession. I just go on with it and I need to find out things. It's November 2019, and this is episode 41 of the WOW Signal Podcast. For more information, please visit wowsignalpodcast.com. Some of you may remember Burst 19 that came out in July of 2016. It featured an interview with a young PhD student named Beatrice Villaroel from the University of Uppsala in Sweden. She and her small team had done a study of older star catalogs, comparing them to more recent star catalogs to see if any stars had gone missing. This was largely driven by SETI. In other words, if a star disappears, one of the possible reasons why it might have gone away was stellar engineering or the construction of some kind of energy capture mechanism around the star, something that's commonly known as Dysonian SETI. Now, normally Dysonian SETI is attacked by looking for infrared excess, which is what Dyson himself recommended in 1960 paper, but which Beatrice VRL and her team looked for was just had the star gone out in the visual spectrum. Now, it would still be quite bright in infrared, but it would, be, it would be missing from a visual survey. So they found one star that did seem to have gone missing from the POS-1 survey, uh, and it was only visible in the red. And so we'll ask her in this episode for an update on that. And there is an update. And also, she has now returned with a... PhD and a much larger team, and she is working now for Stockholm University in Sweden, but she's presently in Tenerife in the Canary Islands. So we have her back on the WOW Signal to talk about the new research and what they have found. And as always, in the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com for this episode, I will have a link to the new paper. I'll, I'll read the title off in a in a minute or two. The paper is on archive right now. It's been approved for publication in the Astronomical Journal. And uh, it's by a coalition of, of astronomers who call themselves VASCO. VASCO stands for the Vanishing and Appearing Sources during a century of observations. Uh, that's the project. This is their first paper. And it's, as we'll discuss, it's quite a long list of contributors, of which uh, Beatrice V. Laurel is the lead author. Now, a couple of points on astronomical jargon. So we didn't stop to explain everything. Uh, arc seconds are a very tiny angle, which is one three thousand six hundredth of a degree. Yes, that's a very, very small angle, but in astronomy, that's actually 
a significant angle because, you know, when you're looking at a very big telescope, there's a lot of magnification. She'll also mention the concept of proper motion, which is something we'll explain during the interview. But essentially, that's just the fact that stars move and stars that are closer to the sun seem to move faster than stars that are farther away on average. And we'll also talk about things like flares. Now, some stars can flare very, very brightly, and that is one possible explanation for some of what they're seeing. Uh, and so that's discussed in more depth in the paper. Now, I would recommend that you get that you go to wowsignalpodcast.com for episode 41. Click on the link. Download the paper and follow along as best you can. We're not going to go through it in exact sequence, but it's good to have reference to the to the images and the graphs in the paper. In particular, you can see on one of the images where the, the vanished star is, and it, it's very, very faint. You have to look closely. And then on the new images that they've taken since then, you'll see where some candidate corresponding objects are. It's it's quite an interesting subject. Uh, as you'll note, like any good scientist, she's very open about her doubts and possible alternative explanations. That's how you do science. You don't uh, stick to one thing and try to prove it at the expense of ignoring every other possible hypothesis. So what she's trying to do here, I think, is quite honorable. It, it, is, it, it has both astrophysics and SETI implications. And so let's just let her explain it for us. This is Beatrice Villarreal, interviewed, recorded on the 14th of November, 2019, from, she's in Tenerife, in the Canary Islands, in Spain. I'm here with Dr. Beatrice Villarreal. Hello, Beatrice. Hello. Now, I just got, a couple of days ago, you sent me a paper that had just been approved for publication. It's a long title, but I'll read the whole thing, <laughs> just to create context here. The Vanishing and Appearing Sources During a Century of Observations Project. Number one. USNO objects missing in modern sky surveys and follow-up observations of a missing star. And the missing stars is, is in quotes. Uh, because we're not, really, <laughs> we're not certain it's missing, right? Uh, exactly. <laughs> okay. Now, so let's start with that. Now, I talked to you in 2016, and I, I'd like to refer listeners to that. Uh, I'll have a link to that in the show notes, in which you did a survey similar to this, but a smaller one, right? And you found one star that might have gone missing. Uh, you weren't sure. And since then, you've done some follow-up observations that were far more sensitive. Can you tell us about what you did? So uh, we had um, the old star from uh, that, that was detected in the POS1 and POS2 surveys, according to the USNO catalog. Right. And if one looked at the images in the red band, in the um, uh, first red band and in the second red band, it looked like there was an object in both. However, uh, we weren't sure because the second detection was kind of meh, if we say it like that. No, let's just, uh, just uh, remind people the POS1 survey was in 1950, right? Yeah, 1950s to 1966, and the other one, uh, POS2, started in 1986. And the image we were looking at was from 1950? Yeah, from 1950, somewhere okay. taken in March. Uh, and, and, there was another, and then the POS2 was, I, what, 93? Is that, is that right? Yeah, 93 or 92. I can't really recall which one it was. Okay, but sometime uh, in the early 90s. Okay, so roughly 40 years apart. And then then you compared that yeah. to the Sloan survey, which is more recent. And, and it, nothing was there. Right, okay. So we got excited because that maybe would be an example of a vanishing star, which we wanted to find. And um, uh, we have done some follow-up observations. We have also reanalyzed a lot of, we have gone through a lot of archival images in different surveys. Uh, let me make some examples. Uh, we have help from our collaborators in Ukraine who have been uh, looking 
uh, and trying to find the stars in um, in the virtual observatory of Ukraine. And well, one basically can't find it anywhere. So um, we did then some follow-up observations, and it, they were led by my colleague Sebastian Comeron, who um, mm, oh yeah, it was called. He such he, he got telescope time uh, for on La Palma with a Nordic optical telescope, and he did, did some way deeper images than what Sloan can produce. And uh, what we find there is that there is an object at the place where there was a star earlier. And so what is this object? This object is like four and a half magnitudes uh, weaker. So actually, if to be honest, there's not one object. There are two very nearby objects. One that is 1.4 arc seconds and the other one that is something like 2.4 arc seconds. So there are two very nearby objects. Of course, the one that is 1.4 arc seconds is going to be more likely to be the same. But one sees that there is an object on the, on the missing spot. So it's likely to be the same, th the same thing. Um, although we cannot promise that it's the same thing, you know, because there's always a probability that you have a background object comes up on the same position, but I think it's not super likely here. But these objects would not have been seen in the Sloan survey. No, right? they were not seen. Yeah. They were not seen before. They're it's far just, too dim. Is that, that's... Yeah, once we, one gets a big telescope, then suddenly there is an object on the spot where there was a missing star before. So... Um, then the question is whether that's a variable star in the past, but I don't think it was, or if it's an object that flared up uh, in the POS1. Maybe we saw it, it's high, high brightness states. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say it could be some high redshift supernova that, uh, that kind of was seen in the POS1 survey. Or it could be... Let's say if the object is some sort of M dwarf, maybe it had a flare exactly when we when the POS POS one was doing the sky survey and it got caught like a point source that is much brighter than it is now. How long do those flares last? Well, I guess it's they can be quite short, like just minutes, also. Oh. Which would explain that one would only see it in one image and not in others because it could be very very short. I see. So that's also a possibility. Okay. So, uh, so we are kind of very excited about it. Uh, I think the current flare has some uh, flare record is on nine point four magnitudes. I don't remember exactly. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so if one would find some uh, extreme flare of ten or eleven magnitudes, we would be quite happy too. Wow. So, yeah. so, 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 so okay. Uh and, not, uh, not purely astrophysical interpretation, <laughs> yeah. of course. <laughs> yeah, and there, and, and uh, for those who are planning to follow up on this in the paper, so in Table 1, you've got listed all the searches for different stars that could match it. And uh, it's quite a long list. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, now, is there a, is there a chance for more follow-ups, or is it about, about as deep as you can go? No, we're going to uh, try to do more follow-up, uh, like with going for deep photometry. Uh, we would like to try to do the same thing as we did for uh, these uh, other objects when we search for telescope time on a bit larger telescopes and went deeper. We want to do the same thing, and if and maybe also we want to do some spectroscopy, trying to identify what are the background objects if you find in any. Mm. It would be nice to know if it's a very, very distant quasar, a very distant or, or like galaxy, or if it's a star. We want to know what it is simply that is causing these right. uh, transients, these, these hundred yeah. of things that we found. But the POS1 is possible. the earliest possible record you could have of that. Is that correct? I think that one could basically also use the DASH survey. But that one goes to maybe dash goes to about magnitude fourteen, yeah. so we would use quite a lot in depth, and we would only see the brightest things. But I think that could also be interesting. Mm -hmm. And then one gets data that is thirty years longer or fifty years longer, or so, which is also nice. Let's move on then to the the new research you've been doing with this much larger team. This is quite a you have quite a long list of co-authors here. I won't read them off, but 
Uh, <laughs> they're all over the world. There's even a couple in the U.S. Yes. Now you've you've gotten much more ambitious. Uh, can you tell us about how much you've expanded the search and how you're doing it? When uh, we were doing it in 2016, everything was done manually to the limit. Uh, let's say there were limits of what my laptop, for instance, could handle without breaking down uh, when it came to data handling. Now we have an IT team uh, at Uppsala University uh, in the was in, in the machine learning group, and they have a uh, constructed a system for cross-matching much more efficiently than I could do. Okay, by that cross-matching, so, we mean basically taking two massive star catalogs, right? Ex exactly. And the, these uh, two catalogs, exactly. now you, you pick PanStars as their new catalog, right? Yes, it's kind of the most recent and the most covering, or I'm sure they, they, there's always going to be something better. We also thought about Gaia, but uh, PanStars seemed like the best choice Yeah. because... It's simply very large, and it was the biggest time gap in between. So you took so. these two massive catalogs, and you did an automated process, right? And you came up with how many candidates? So this was this was done as a part of a master thesis work by Johan Sodla, the second author. Mm -hmm. And he took 60% of the USNO catalog, because there were some regions that were more difficult for him to process computationally. I, I don't know exactly how it works. Um, because this is uh, the table of the IT. <laughs> um, so, so they cross-matched it and um, they got an initial list of candidates where we had to uh, remove those that had had a, was called slightly too high proper motion or that were, we couldn't, for instance, uh, uh, use objects in USNO that were lying outside the PanStars um, covering of the sky because um, PanStars doesn't cover below declinations of minus 30. Right. And uh, so for instance, these things, so they cross matched it and they got a table of uh, 150,000 mismatches. Now this 150,000 depends on a cross matching radius we have used. We have used a very large cross matching radius, which one should could actually use a much smaller one. And then one can increase the number of mismatches. But in this run, we use this larger one because then we also implicitly solve a lot of proper motion related issues. Right. Now, by proper motion, we mean uh, how much the star moves in the sky over, uh, what is it, it uh, more, more than almost 70 years, right? Exactly. So, so stars that are closer to the sun will move more, right? And you picked a rather large one of 30 arc seconds, right? which is yes. a lot for a star to move even in 70 years. Yes. So yeah, and the simple thing, uh, if one picks 30 arc seconds, then yes, there are a number of matches one loses because within 30 arc seconds you could have several um, matches, or like, or there might be some several corresponding objects. However, if nothing is seen within 30 arc seconds, then the, the candidate date gets much stronger. Also, mm -hmm. I see. So that, but we are going to try to do it with five arc seconds too will be more work and more images to look through. <laughs> so when you got to the 150,000, uh, what did you do after that? Well, we have first analyzed it um, statistically. We have tried to look at the uh, various properties of colors and um, proper motion, magnitudes. And so there are a lot of histograms in the table. So we try to understand it statistically. And we find that, yes, many of our mismatches have, have a bit higher proper motions, which is not unexpected. They're also a bit redder, which I think is because many of them are found, it's, it's a selection effect. Many of them are found in the POS1 red survey. And I think this has something to do with how the USNO catalog was constructed, uh -huh. which I don't know the exact technical details, but depending on the construction of USNO, how they defined what is an object, we're going to see a reflection of that. In our, in our candidate selection and properties. So we looked at this a little bit uh, like statistically, and then I was also curious. So uh, a fraction of these candidates we also looked at in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, mm, which is, it was quite a lot of images, I must admit, a lot of images. And um, it was 15% of the sample of the of the mismatch sample 
that one could look at in the Sloan. So we compared and we first got an initial list of, uh, of images that could be interesting, then looked in more detail and looked in more detail. And then once one throws away all the candidates that might have been just dirt on the POS1 or POS2, um, th then one ends up with these 100 candidates that we found. So that was done just by a lot of people looking at images? No, it was done by one person who was too curious and I couldn't help it. Oh. <laughs> um, That's a we lot were, of work. <laughs> it was a lot of work, but I, I was too curious. And the thing is that if one really wants to know, sometimes one, one finds the effort to do it. So well, Yeah, so in table two, you have a list of about 100 that survived all the tests. Yes, which doesn't mean that it can cannot be some sort of uh, plate flaws or something like that anyway. So, uh, but we've done our best with trying to remove all of them and doing all kind of tests and. Right. So these to, these to, are these are stars that did not appear that did appear in POS one, right? Or po or just or POS pointers. two. Uh, uh, is those that are in POS one or POS two and did not and did not appear later again they just have one detection somewhere or maybe one of them actually has more than one detection but they didn't so they weren't they were neither in the sloan or in the uh Panstar. or or the pan stars okay yep. no. so we kind of yeah these are these sort of uh, point sources that uh, were seen once and then just vanished and in table three you've got the brighter ones right the the ones that you said, well, you're, it says the most interesting candidates, and that's a much smaller number, about 30 or so. Exactly. Uh, it's 27 or so. Okay, so that, that, uh, so that leads me to the next question. Uh, how much follow-up can we do? How follow-up observation can we do with those? Well, first, what we are doing now is that we are going to – uh, remeasure all the old plates magnitudes. That's one thing we, we have to do, which is going to be a quite big work because it's old plates and one really needs experts who can, uh, who, who know how to do it well with photog photographic plates. That's one thing we are doing. Um, okay. Because sure, I, I, I can, I have measured the magnitudes myself, but I want to actually have much more, much better estimates than what I can do. So that's one of the things we are going to, um, because if one has the, if we know perfectly uh, the magnitudes of these objects, we will know also the amplitude of them. If you have the amplitude distribution, maybe you can compare it to the expectations of M dwarf flares or some other typical uh, amplitude. Uh -huh. So theoretically, one could try to constrain what type of object it is from this. Also, if we have the colors, um, of course, in order to have the color, we need to have detections in more uh, in more uh, filters. For instance, what I will be doing is that I will be looking. Um, I, today, a colleague of mine showed me uh, a new a new survey I didn't know about earlier. This survey goes uh, like two magnitudes deeper than Sloan. Oh. Yeah, and that's fantastic. So what I will be doing is that I will be going through all the sources uh, in this survey and try to see if which ones can be found there and in which filters and try to see if I can extract something about the colors. Right. And there's some new surveys that are in the not too distant future, right? So, uh, always. And hopefully also the new space telescope that's several years away. Uh, w first. Yes. That's, that's probably what five or six years in the future before they even start on that. I think we will not wait that long with a follow up. <laughs> we yeah, will but very, it's a it'd be very sensitive infrared survey. So <laughs> that would that would be something. In, oh yes. Good to check with anyway. And also, there was a mention here of a of a citizen science project. Yes. So this is something we are working on. Um, the IT team in Uppsala they have uh, been uh, developing a small tool. Um, called ML Blink. I don't know how much I'm allowed to tell on the podcast about it, but it's an artificial intelligence that helps to select 
images that are the most relevant. Oh. So uh, because let's say if we get 12 million images in when we do uh, uh, the update of the project, when we let's say we do the five arc second cut mm -hmm. uh, cross match, maybe if we get 12 million images, we don't want all the people to look through 12 Im million images. And then it's good if there's an AI that does some pre-selection and that one can that has some sort of self-learning uh, So this would be similar to something like Galaxy Zoo where people look at the images and make some kind of qualitative judgment. Is that I would say so. I would yeah. say so. Like is that a is that a, a defect on the plate or something like that? Yeah. Yes. Or if they can identify is there something interesting on this plate at all? Oh, okay. Uh, because sometimes a lot of things are very often, uh, I notice that when, when one gets the two images, let's say from uh, Sloan and uh, You Snow, and, so, and one compares them, there is absolutely nothing interesting on these images. There is just something, some sort of error that listed it like a mismatch. And a lot of candidates are false, or you have oversaturation near a bright star. There's a lot of things that happen that make the candidates pretty uh, that makes that majority of, of these candidates can be excluded. But it has to be done visually because in many cases, because there's, there is some small um, thing that influences or... Uh, yeah. So, so there's actually quite a lot of these candidates just get thrown away directly, immediately, and, and okay. it's difficult to automatize. So, uh, so this, so... I know we as we noted earlier the the title of this paper is number 1 so there are more papers you anticipate coming up from this team I hope so yes um uh, there's at least uh, one uh, paper that should be submitted anytime in the coming weeks Oh that's a paper by uh Sudla um, no, that's the paper by Pelkmans et al Oh okay It's the machine learning Oh I see Okay. When that bit work, then we will be able to do the citizen science project. Yeah. Now you started this out as a kind of a SETI project, right? It, yes. There's still a possibility of seeing a techno signature this way. Could you explain how that could be? How that could work? Yes, there are several different ways. Actually, there there are several different techno signatures that can be detected by us. Uh, first is, of course, the vanishing star still uh, is the same idea as I had in the 2016 paper. It's something that would be pretty impossible unless you have a failed supernova. Um, that was one of the techno signatures. But there's also, for instance, if you have red communication lasers and someone at some point in the 50s, in case we would be able to... Um, catch one of these signals with the um, Palomar surveys during the 1950s. Maybe it is on the images. And uh, one could expect that a number of red transients in case someone is shooting or not shooting, but I mean, just having lasers on could be detected this way. Mm -hmm. And um, so, of course, we, we would be interested in any sort of unexplainable red transient, especially if it would be repeating or itself or so. And of course, it's something that would be uh, dropping very strongly in variability, let's say, due to a big structure that comes in front or something Dyson related, maybe not a Dyson sphere, but some other structure could also be detected by our survey. So we simply are going to collect everything. And uh, of course, we are going to detect a lot of astrophysical transients. And we are equally happy about that because... Um, we want also to find extreme objects, uh, normal astro astrophysical objects that we can study or that right. especially because um, the different authors on the paper have different research interests and also, and uh, some are more interested into finding some uh, unusual stars that they can try to study stellar evolution on and so on. Yeah. Now, you study you study uh, galaxies mostly on your AGN AGN has yeah. been my such field. Uh, so those active galactic nuclei, right? Uh, exactly. Which is that big black hole at the center of a galaxy that puts out a lot of light. Uh, yes. And other energy. Oh, um, oh, the surrounding gas around it puts out yeah. a lot of. And uh, 
what uh you also mentioned in your paper failed supernova which is a kind of a strange thing right i mean but you, you conclude that they're they must be very rare you're, you're not yeah, seeing a whole lot of those rare. Yeah, yes, they must be very rare, although it's not impossible that it happens in the Milky Way. So if we would have a beautiful vanishing star that that one day disappears, it could be a fantastic uh, like um, candidate for a failed supernova. Actually, no, no candidate so far has been confirmed because this is a theoretical concept, the failed supernova. That right. the supernova theoreticians have, like, uh, they, they need to try to... Um, they have created this concept uh, out of theoretical need and uh, there is this prediction that failed supernova might exist and so if we would find if we find any support in in favor of this theoretical idea that would be nice also now the theor the theory is that essentially a black hole forms and just right away yeah. and sucks in most of the material or is that how yeah, sometimes stars of certain masses, they just uh, collapse directly into black holes, the supernova researchers believe. And within, when they are simply heavier than, or when they are within, what is it, the range 18 to 25 solar masses or something like that. Wow. So very, very large star. A very large star. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. But they are not very likely to be happening in the Milky Way where one predicts it to happen maybe once every two or three hundred years. Hmm. However, it is not impossible that one would detect it if one has the data for a hundred years of yeah, that's, of time window. You have a, you have a chance, yeah. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, the longer this goes, the more better chance of detecting any of these things, right? So Exactly, that's what we were thinking that one should simply try to use as a big time window as possible. Right. Now, on the POS-1 survey, I would think there would be at least a few super supernovas that appeared. And, and Absolutely. That, and because I, I know that uh, Gaia detects them almost every day. Right? Yeah. Uh, so there, there's... Uh, so some of those 150,000 are probably supernovas, but... Probably not all, right? Well, the thing is, if it would be a low redshift supernova, one would detect it both in the blue band and in in the red band of POS, yeah, of the of the POS one or the POS two. But you only saw the star in the red, so it would have to be. Yeah, and it was such. I, I don't. In many of these, uh, in many of these candidates, I was trying to just look at the time of the blue band observation and the red band observation. And it was done with just one hour in between. And it was clearly visible in one and not visible at all in the second. Mm. So it cannot be a supernova for those, or it's very, very red shifted or something like that. But that seems unlikely. So uh, I don't think it's supernova. I would exclude that. I think this is really great research, and I, I'm, I'm glad you followed yes. up. I'm extremely excited about this project. I think it's a bit yeah. of an obsession. I just go on with it, and I need to find out things. And well, well good for you. Keep it up. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but I get some sleep once in a while. <laughs> I will try to. <laughs> we hope you would get a bit more press coverage than you ha that it has. I haven't seen anything yet, but thanks for joining us. And hopefully, I'll have lots of interest in this, and we'll we'll be waiting your next your team's next paper. So thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So bye talk bye. To you the time. Bye. Well, I'd like to once again to extend my thanks to Beatrice Vrol, who sent me the PDF of the paper a day before it appeared on the archive website. And she also went out of her way to try to appear on this podcast as soon as possible after that came out. So uh, thank you. And I hope you all now understand much better what that research is about. No one should jump on this and say that the Vasco team has found aliens, but they certainly have found some interesting candidates to follow up on. Many of them will have normal astrophysical explanations. 
Some will have no explanation uh, because there just will never be enough information. Others might be good SETI candidates. So hopefully people like the SETI Institute will take a look at some of these stars and uh, see if they can detect anything interesting. Now, it's a long shot, yes, because what are the odds that the thousands of years ago that these stars may have disappeared, somebody sent uh, a radio signal to the Earth, which at the time had no indication that there was any kind of advanced technological civilization on the Earth. Uh, very low. It's very low. But it'd be worth it, worth a go just to see if anything gets picked up. Perhaps there's there's been ongoing activity from those stars. We don't know, of course. But that's how you why you do follow up observations. You do experiments to find out if there's any kind of interesting energy coming from any of those those stars. There's lots of other reasons that she points out, and also more or less in the paper why a star might disappear. Or and by disappear, of course, we mean it becomes fainter than the threshold of the survey. So if the survey can survey down to say a magnitude of 21, uh, which is quite dim. A dimmer magnitude, like 24, it might still be visible. But since we can't see it at 21, uh, we, we consider it to have disappeared. So essentially what we're talking about is stars that dim quite a lot. Uh, or, as she discussed, move away so far from the field of view that uh, they're no longer visible. They tried to account for that in the study, but you know, there's always it's always some possibility that it moved faster than we think it's is likely. Now, if you are disinclined to read professional astronomy papers, and I can understand that, you might want to ask questions about it. Uh, I'd be happy to try to explain it to you as best I can. I, of course, I'm not the expert. That's why we had her on. But uh, I'm available to do that. Uh, you can email us at wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com. You can comment directly on the blog at wowsignalpodcast.com. We are frequently on Discord, and there's a link to our Discord server uh, at wowsignalpodcast.com, or you can just ask me. Uh, also, we frequently are around on Twitter at podcastwow, and we do have a Facebook page. It's not very active, but you can certainly comment there if you prefer. Uh, we even have a subreddit, which I think is even less active than the Facebook page. But feel free to go there, and I will see your comment eventually and respond to it. So, by all means, get your questions answered. Now, if you are a professional astronomer and have read the paper and would like to comment on it, I would be happy to talk to you, and we can record your comments, and we'll do... Uh, another episode or a burst with your comments. I like to. I would actually like to get the comments of two or three or even four researchers, not only in the SETI area but also in uh, stellar astrophysics, who have some interest in this research, whether it's critical or whether it's praise or some combination of the two. That's fine. Let's hear from you. You can again email wowsignalpodcast at gmail dot com and and I will pick that up same day. Again, I encourage you to engage and let's find out what's really going on here. Uh, and I also am very hopeful that the follow-up observations will bear some fruit. In many cases, we'll find out, oh, well, uh, no big deal. Maybe all the cases that will be the result. We'll see. Okay, now for the nagging and begging part of the show, your favorite part. Please, if whatever service you get your podcast on, whether it's iTunes or Pocket Cast or whatever, leave us a review. Uh, even if it's not a five-star review, we'd like to get your thoughts. And as long as they're your, your honest opinion, we even have now, we are now pushing these episodes to YouTube. If you want to go on YouTube and comment there, you can. And uh, so give us a like, a subscribe. If, that, if you're a YouTube person, if you're on 
any of the, any of the services, you should subscribe to the podcast. That way you won't, you won't miss an episode. You'll get them just about as soon as they come out. If you want to get them even sooner than they come out, I'd like to suggest Patreon. You go to patreon.com slash wow signal. And for a very small pledge, which is per episode, by the way. So if we don't put out episodes in a given month, you don't pay. And per episode, say $1 per episode, you will get the vast majority of the episodes in advance. Or if I can't give you the whole episode in advance, I will give you at least the raw interview or some other audio goodies, maybe outtakes, that, which are available only to Patreon supporters. So those of you who are Patreon supporters, thank you very much. Those of you who are not yet but are thinking about it, well, that's one of the perks you'll get in addition to, of course, a better, more frequent podcast. So we'd appreciate any support you want to give us. Uh, we don't, frankly, deserve a big contribution, just a small amount. And uh, we'll do what we can to make sure that we are worthy of that. And again, thank you to Beatrice Villarreal. Our music was by DJ Spooky, as usual, and also Jason Robinson. And this has been episode 41 of the Wow Signal podcast. This has been the Wow Signal, a podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel. Please visit wowsignalpodcast.com for more information. All music presented on this podcast is either Creative Commons or is presented with the permission of the artist. The Wow Signal is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike License.